Before we start things off properly, I just wanted to cut off a certain type of comment at the ankle. Just quickly going to say that the Starship design rules, as set by Gene Roddenberry, are not canon and have not been followed by canon starships and will have no bearing on this video. Why do I say this? Well, aside from the fact that ships with more or less than two nacelles are prominently canon throughout the various Trek shows and movies, ships with no nacelles exist, and there are plenty of ships with no deflectors as well. There is also the issue that Roddenberry apparently made the rules only after the FASA-verse became a thing in the 1970s, this being done as a means to assert his role as the creator of the show. And at no point during the development or run of the original series were these rules a thing, at least as far as I can find. Regardless of whether they were an established rule or not, they weren't by Wrath of Khan, because Miranda breaks those rules, so it's fairly obvious that some designers pay attention to them, but most don't, and most design ships that look cool to them, regardless of if they follow these non-canon rules or not. So, leave that kind of comment, oh, it breaks the starship design rules, and therefore isn't canon alone, because obviously these ships are going to be canon. Uh, we are only talking about canon ships, specifically ones in the sort of next generation era, uh, various other ones exist. We talk about a couple from the 23rd century, but they're all canon. Uh, we don't talk about any in the new shows, and we don't talk about any in um, sort of the Kelvin universe. You're free to design your own fanships, which follow the rules, of course, but as Trek itself has never followed these rules, uh, which were made after the fact, we're not going to do so here. So, with that said... We can begin. This took two minutes. This was a lot longer than I thought it would be. Oh well. Starting things off. Throughout the history of Starfleet, there have been numerous vessels which have more or less than the typical number of nacelles. And the reasons for this vary, but all in essence boil down to what the warp field geometry and the planned use case for the ship is. Let's just firstly briefly describe what a warp nacelle is and what role it performs, as this will come in handy later on. Warp nacelles project the warp field of a starship so equipped and act as the means by which a ship achieves warp flight. Now, a single nacelle can function on its own to generate a warp field in most cases. But a second nacelle, to help stabilize and reduce drag, can be beneficial. Uh, and many other areas as well, such as maneuvering at warp, reduced fuel load, higher fuel efficiency, lower stresses placed upon each nacelle as they share uh, the energy output. And this explains why twin nacelles are so common among most starship classes in service throughout the galaxy. In the following few minutes, we will go over some examples of ship classes with one, three, and four nacelles, which deviate from this rule. We'll explore what they were built to do, and how their unusual nacelle arrangements aided them in carrying out their roles. And because we're doing this from least to greatest, we are starting with ships with just a single nacelle. In terms of ships with just a single nacelle in Starfleet, we have the Freedom Class Destroyer from the 24th century, which can be seen in the aftermath of the Wolf 359 wreckage. And then, from the 23rd century, the Saladin and Hermes classes, a destroyer and scout class respectively, which can be seen in various background shots on computer screens of the Enterprise in the various original series movies. Alongside these canon ships, and yes, I'm saying the Saladin and Hermes are canon designs, we also have one in Strange New Worlds, but seeing how new that show is at the time of writing, I don't want to count it yet until we know more about it and have more of a feel for the show. Regardless, these ships are built for only short-term operations, where their single nacelle will, will be subjected to high stresses, generating a warp field on its own for an entire starship, but only temporarily, as the occasions where the ships would be really put through their paces would be few and far between. As such, the short lifespan of their nacelles and the security of having two nacelles are of less of a concern than the lower costs associated in building a ship with just a single nacelle, hence justifying them in these specific use cases. Next up in our list, we have ships with three. 
In canon, we have various three nacelle designs in the form of the Federation class battleship, which appeared in background footage just like the Saladin and Hermes classes, and is from the sort of Franz Joseph Fassa era designs. There is also the Niagara class, which appeared as a wreck in the aftermath of the Battle of Wolf 359, just like the Freedom. And finally, we have the Galaxy Refit Dreadnought, the most notable three nacelled ship in current Trek canon. Ships with three nacelles seldom use all three of their nacelles at once, as a triple axis warp field is very tricky to maintain and unstable even when it does offering very few advantages over a dual-axis warp field, even if you can get it to work f completely, perfectly fine. And it's more fuel-intensive, uh, so why do it? Instead, such equipped ships use their nacelles in sequence, staggering their use so that two are in use and one is cooling down at all times. As high warp uh, stresses mean that nacelles can overheat, and require a cooldown period. When the next nacelle in sequence begins to overheat, the ship drops down to a lower warp speed, and then switches nacelles over before accelerating again. This arrangement is not ideal, as it requires a ship to drop out of high warp, to switch over, subjects the nacelles to very high stresses when changing over, and has other technological and mechanical limitations. But it does make sense in certain use cases, and as we have seen it employed on a number of occasions by Starfleet, at times it does make sense, even if it is sort of the outlier in this list. Starfleet has operated numerous classes with four nacelles, from the constellation of the 23rd century to the Cheyenne, Prometheus, and several others of the 24th, and the latest Sagan class from the early years of the 25th century. Such ships with four nacelles are, oddly, the most conventional of all the layouts we have seen so far, in essence being two traditional paired nacelles sharing the same hull, with one pair operating at high power for as long as possible, before switching off the next pair to cool down and wait their next turn. This permits ships so equipped to travel at very high speeds for prolonged periods, and has been used generally when, and when available engine power outstrips available nacelle technology, with Starfleet and most other organizations generally preferring two nacelles in high speed, but settling on four nacelles in high speed when necessary. Later iterations of the four nacelle layout would feature the ability to gradually power up one nacelle and power down the other, so as to maintain the same speed as the ship moves without slowing down as other ships of prior generations would. A four-nacelle layout has traditionally been very difficult to achieve successfully, and chief engineers of ships so fitted have had to endure all manner of abuse at the hands of their vessels, making them unpopular with their crews generally, though once they get the hang of it, crews of ships with four-nacelles can be fanatical in their devotion to their ship. If on paper they may be the most technologically sophisticated that Starfleet may commission in any given era, four nacelled ships are seldom worth the associated costs and complexities, and thus are comparatively rare, though it is, it must be said, more functional and more common than single or three nacelle designs. Of course, it's dwarfed by ships with two nacelles because that's the default most efficient system. Well, there are the most common and unusual nacelle arrangements for Starfleet ships. I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, then be sure to give it a like and maybe drop a comment about what your favorite unusual layout for a Starfleet ship is. I also have a Patreon, where Patreon members can vote about video topics um, such as this. This was a Patreon vote. It was also a vote for uh, YouTube subscribers, which hopefully, if you're watching this video, you are. But if not... Um, subscribe. Um, and where was I? Oh yes, Patreon. Uh, supporting me on Patreon lets you do things like votes, suggest videos, you get a weekly newsletter. There's several perks when I remember, which I'm bad at, but you know, we'll work on that. Um, maybe joining my Patreon would uh, motivate me to um, be less crap. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, if that's the uh, the call to action that you needed and you've sub uh, supported me on Patreon as we speak, um, thank you. 
For everybody else that has got this far into the video and this kind of unhinged um, outro that I tend to do, uh, a brownie point to you. You can definitely point out in a comment that you have a brownie point and nobody else does. Um, for everybody else that has not uh, got to this point in the video, 